In the mid-330s, the first Christian emperor, Constantine I, and you saw you have already know this, this is a repeat, but I'm going to, some of you missed morning, so. So the first Christian emperor, Constantine I, ordered the construction of a freestanding baptistry for his newly constructed Basilica Constantiniana, now more widely known as the Basilica of St. John Lateran in Rome. Some of you may have seen the Pope fly over this in his helicopter on his way to Castle Gandolfo this week. This St. John Lateran was the first major Christian church built in the city of Rome, and Constantine intended it to be the eternal city's cathedral. Built just outside of Rome's ancient sacred center of the Forum and the Palatine, Constantine used some available land, formerly the barracks of the Imperial Horse Guard, a group that had backed his rival emperor, Maxentius. He converted an adjacent palace, the property of his second wife, Fausta, and Maxentius' sister, into the official residence of Rome's bishop. And you know what? It still is actually the official church of the Pope. Nobody really knows that. But today, this is uh, the back side of it. Today, the emperor's statue, a fourth century monument found in the baths of Diocletian, graces the porch of the basilica. It's also interesting, the two front doors of this basilica are from the Curie, the Senate House in Rome. So, very significant. According to tradition, first recorded in a 6th century document, the Conversio Constantini, included in the Acts of Sylvester, the Pope, the Emperor Constantine was baptized shortly after his conversion, around 314, by Pope Sylvester in the Lateran Baptistry. Well, this is a painting of it, uh, a medieval painting of the baptism of Constantine, which is in another church in Rome, Santi Quattro Coronati. Sources closer to this event report, probably more reliably, that while Constantine had hoped to be baptized in the Jordan River, he was actually received baptism on his deathbed in 337 while visiting his imperial villa at Nicomedia. And there's another painting that's now in the Vatican of this um, supposed baptism of Constantine in the Lateran Baptistry by the Pope Sylvester. He's, the costumes don't quite match the time period, but, but I want you to notice the, 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 the structure that we're seeing here as well, which is what the interior now looks like. Whatever the case about Constantine's baptism, we're pretty certain that the Lateran Basilica and its large octagonal baptistry were richly endowed through the emperor's patronage. The baptistry was con constructed over one of the original palace baths, thus making use of existing plumbing. According to the Book of the Popes, the Liber Pontificalis, Constantine ordered the baptismal font to be constructed from the imperial purple porphyry marble and covered inside and out with silver sheathing. In the middle of the basin, a porphyry column supported a solid golden bowl large enough to hold 200 pounds of incense. Seven silver stags served as water fountains to fill the font, and around the font stood two silver life-size statues of Christ and John the Baptist and one solid golden lamb. About a century later, the Pope Sixtus III, 432 to 40, carried out a major renovation of the space. The Pope added a set of these eight porphyry columns, now they've never, constantly never a porphyry font, that circled the font and were joined by a marble architrave. So, this is the exterior. Here we are back in the interior. <clears throat> On top of this architrave, another set of marble columns and a second lintel or architrave supported a lantern-style cupola that pierced the original peaked roof. A view of that. A wide porch was attached to one side, creating an entrance vestibule. The eight porphyry columns, perhaps the most significant of Sixtus's renovations, were mentioned in the Book of the Popes, along with an inscription that was engraved on the architrave that topped them. Here we are again, and here's this verse. In the eight verses, 
The inscription summarizes the purpose and meaning of baptism, at least in this particular time and place. As you heard this morning, they're attributed to Leo the Great, probably composed while he was archdeacon prior to being elevated to the bishop's throne in 440. So once again, we're going to look at these verses and we're going to talk about a different way to think of them. So a people to be consecrated to the heavens, here is born from a fertile seed, established by waters made fruitful by the Spirit. Plunge in, O sinner, be cleansed from the sacred flow. Whom it receives old, the way returns new. No differences exist among those being reborn, whom one font, one spirit, and one faith make one. By a virginal birth, the mother church bears the children, whom she conceives by God's breathing, and she births by this stream. Wishing to be innocent, wash in the bath, whether you are burdened by ancestral sin or your own. This is the fountain of life, which has cleansed the whole world, taking its origin from Christ's wound. Hope for the heavenly kingdom, once you have been reborn in this spring, that happy life does not admit those only once born. Let neither the number nor the kind of their sins frighten. Anyone born in this reborn in this river will be holy. Several themes appear in these lines, which reflect Leo's baptismal theology. Oops, I might have myself and leave it there. Christians represent a new sacred people or a nation, a gens, an identity that would have been particularly significant in the ancient Roman capital. Two, these people are born from the womb of the virginal mother church in water that was fertilized by the Holy Spirit. This is a very important thing for Leo, who talks a lot about the church's mother and the baptismal font as her womb and the, and the, and the fecundity of that womb being made by the Holy Spirit. Three, as children born from the same womb, they are joined to one another. The baptized have no difference in rank or status. They're like brothers and sisters. Four, the fountain, the water of life, originates from Christ's wound and cleanses and renews, washing away ancestral sin, original sin, as well as individual personal transgressions. And five, the rebirth offers hope for eternal life in the heavenly kingdom. Okay. On the other side of the Roman Empire, in the Egyptian capital of Alexandria, and somewhere in the late 380s or 390s, a blind Christian teacher named Didymus wrote his summary of the effects of baptism. The Holy Spirit as God renovates us in baptism and in union with the Father and the Son brings us back from a state of deformity to our pristine beauty, and so fills us with his grace that we can no longer make room for anything that is unworthy of our love. He, he frees us from sin and death and from the things of this earth, makes us spiritual persons, sharing in the divine glory, children and heirs of God and of the Father. He conforms us to the image of the Son of God and makes us his brothers. He gives us heaven in exchange for earth and bestows paradise with a bounteous hand and makes us more honorable than the angels and in the divine waters of baptism extinguishes the inextinguishable fire of hell. Didymus continues, explaining that by baptismal immersion, recipients strip off their old selves as well as their sins. They are regenerated, sealed, and signed by the Holy Spirit. They put on Christ as an incorruptible garment, and they find themselves as they were originally created, free of sin and in the perfect image of God. And Didymus anticipates some of the themes found in Leo's verses, such as the regenerative cleansing from original sin, but he adds and elaborates a few others. Now I think we have. Baptism restores the pristine beauty of humanity's creation in the Imago Dei, the image of God, both sinless and able to resist sin. Two, baptism bestows divine grace, sustaining its recipients in their pure love of God. Three, baptism is the ritual by which Christians are adopted as children of God and thus become co-heirs to the kingdom and to eternal life. Four, the baptized receive the seal of the Holy Spirit 
and are indelibly marked with the sign of Christ. These rich enumerations to the effects of baptism are like many others found in the writings of the Church Fathers from the 3rd through the 5th centuries. Such writings demonstrate that baptism was a complex and many-staged ritual, in fact, a ritual passage rather than one single event, and had multiple purposes and manifold meanings and effects. Early, Christian, early Christian initiation, therefore, was formative and transformative, bodily and spiritual, the beginning of a new life on earth and the promise of life beyond death. It included a variety of distinct ceremonial gestures, among them exorcism, anointing, disrobing, dunking, making the sign of the cross, and the receiving the imposition of hands. Water was elemental, but the multi-part ritual also required salt and oil and light and special clothing. In my most recent book, I grouped baptism's many themes or purposes into five general categories, a little artificially, but otherwise it wasn't too long a book. Aligning these purposes with scripture passages, ritual practices, and the physical context that reflected and reified them. Although many aspects of these, or these themes overlapped with one another, each was founded on biblical texts and expressed in distinct actions and images. Oh. I guess there they are. Okay. <laughs> Baptism is first of all cleansing and healing. It's a washing from sin and a restoration of innocence and healing of the body. So those, some of these biblical texts are the texts that I would pick up to go with these, and you might recognize them. Baptism is inclusion. It's adoption as heirs of the kingdom. You become you know, a, a royal priesthood, a holy people. You join the community, you become inside the body, you receive the marks of membership through the creed, through a new name, through the signing of the cross. Baptism is in the transmission of the Holy Spirit. It's sanctifying and illuminative. You gain spiritual knowledge. Um, you receive sanctification. Fourth, baptism is regenerative. It's death and rebirth. It's renewal. It's a dying to the old self and being reborn from the church's womb. Many of you already know Romans 6, that idea of being reborn into Christ through, by participating in Christ's death, also participating in Christ's resurrection. And finally, baptism is a renewal of the entire creation, a reestablishment of Eden, and a return of the, of, the kid, of the Christians to become the state of new Adam and new Eve. I'm not going to summarize my book in this lecture, but in order to set, out, to set this out, in order to show the manifold levels of baptismal symbolism, which guide my interpretation of certain common motifs or subject of early Christian painting, sculpture, and mosaics as well as things that appear in glass and gems and ceramic, ceramic and metal. These subjects, most of them based on biblical figures or stories, often are identified only in reference to their narratives. Thus, you may see in the handbook of early Christian art an image like this with the label, The Fall of Adam and Eve. These handbooks rarely speculate on what I think is a more interesting question. Why this set, this image, or any set of images was selected for a particular context. This is, in, in fact, in a chamber of Rome's catacomb of Peter and Marcellinus. So why Adam and Eve in a tomb is my question. Any quick survey of such handbooks shows that, moreover, that the catalog of early Christian motifs is quite limited. Most surviving Christian art comes from a funerary context, from catacombs and from tombs. In these venues, the same images are repeated again and again. They include scenes from both the Old and New Testament, Adam and Eve, Abraham and Isaac, Moses, Daniel, the three Hebrew youths in the fiery furnace, Jonah, Jesus changing water into wine, multiplying loaves, healing the sick, or raising Lazarus, just to name a few. When I began my study of early Christian art, such constant repetition of certain biblical scenes, especially in funerary settings, catacombs, tombs, piqued my curiosity. I wondered if there was some pattern to the popularity and decided to explore whether this 
fairly limited set of motifs shared some common purpose or symbolic meaning that united them as a group, something that was particularly and especially appropriate for a funerary setting. When I noticed that many of these same motifs turned up in the decoration of baptistries, I thought I might have found an answer. I followed this up with a study of early Christian sermons and scripture commentaries on the, on the subjects of these images, the Bible stories. Now, early Christian teachers rarely interpret, interpreted a Bible story merely as a historical narrative. Each was assumed to bear some spiritual, metaphorical, or symbolic meaning beyond its literal sense. Many of them served as prophetic figures or types of future events or actions. For example, Abraham's offering of his son Isaac points to Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Isaac prefigures the obedient beloved son carrying the wood of his own sacrifice and voluntarily offered to God. Similarly, Daniel's proclaiming Susanna's innocence foreshadows Pilate's refusal to find any guilt in Jesus. By applying this same exegetical approach to an analysis of early Christian visual art, I began to see that most images contain at least two levels of meaning. They need to bear their literal sense, of course, otherwise it wouldn't work, but that's never the end point. Their popularity is based on the associations they carried, the other stories or events to which they pointed, and the sense, and that, the sense they made in any particular context. When I began to coordinate, therefore, the most popular themes in early Christian funerary art with the way their underlying stories were symbolically interpreted in early Christian sermons or commentaries, I started to see a pattern. A majority of them projected sacramental associations, if you'll pardon the word sacramental in this context. Many were linked with the Christian sacred meal, and even more of them reflected on baptism. Why baptism? Because baptism is a sacrament, ordinance, by which an individual is incorporated into the body of the saved and offered the hope of life beyond death. It is a ritual of identity and promise, and thus images that allude to the baptism of the deceased would be a perfect adornment for a tomb or a coffin. Let me try to demonstrate how this works. In what's left of this lecture, I will show a selection, just a selection, of these widely popular early Christian images and, I hope fairly briefly, explain how they could be related to an aspect or effect, one of those aspects or effects I lined out earlier, of baptism. To strengthen my case, I will cite some of the early Christian texts that make the similar connections. The first two are not specific narrative images, but rather broad symbols that are widely popular in early Christian art and have biblical grounding. I, not, I will not limit their significance to baptismal allusions, but I do think they could have referred to the way baptism was a ritual <coughs> of incorporation into the community of the saved. Both of them, the good shepherd with his flock and the fisher reeling in his catch, show up in funerary contexts and in baptismal decor. So, the shepherd. The good shepherd is, without any doubt, one of the most common images in early Christian art. This is from the catacomb of Priscilla. Here's a tomb plaque. And here's a shepherd in a sarcophagus. As a metaphor for Jesus' caretaking love, it was, the shepherd is more than a baptismal image, of course. Still, the imagery of the flock was, a widely, was widely applied to the members of the church, and their newest members were often compared to newly shorn sheep coming up from the washing, from Song of Songs 4 and 6. Images of the shepherd and his flock appear in the baptistries of Dura Europus, Ravenna, and Naples, as we have seen already. And Constantine apparently presented a solid gold lamb to the Lateran baptistry. Numerous ancient texts describe the newly baptized with pastoral imagery. For example, the 4th century hymn writer Ephraim the Syrian compared their final sealing with the branding of newborn lambs. He says, quote, 
The sheep leapt with joy to see the hand in readiness to baptize. O lambs, receive your marking. Enter in and mingle with the flock. Today the angels rejoice in you more than in all the rest of the sheep. Or on the other side of the world, Paulinus of Noah from Italy says, um, at the end of a letter he writes, from the, flock, from the font, the bishop, as shepherd, leads babes, snowy white in body and heart and garb. Circling the novice lambs around the festive altar, he initiates their tender mouths with health-giving food. Here, the older members of the community uh, rejoice together in a noisy throng, and the flock bleats an alleluia. I don't like that image. So, we get the shepherd, the fisher and the fish. Fishers and fish were common figures in early Christian funerary art, as in this catacomb of Calixtus and this in San Sebastiano. The miraculous catch of fish appears in the baptistry of Naples. Oops, there's another fisher. He has, he's way over here on the right. Notice he's also joined to an image of the baptism of Jesus, which is sort of interesting. Here we have the miraculous catch of fish. And I think may have also been depicted at Dura Europus along with Jesus walking on the water. The image of the fish, of course, evokes Jesus' word to the disciples. From now on, you'll be fishers of people. The fourth century bishop of Jerusalem plays on this theme, however, when he speaks to candidates for baptism. Here, instead of a net, Cyril's fisher uses a line. He says this, let yourself be taken alive. Don't try to escape. It is Jesus who is playing you on the hook, not to kill you, but by killing you to make you alive. The baptismal relevance of fish is so obviously connected to the fact that fish live in the water. Also, by the way, baptismal fonts were also called, often called piscini, piscina, which is, means fish pond. But the word fish is also, as many of you would realize, an acrostic for the title, Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior. So this is a, a Roman uh, funeral plaque for a woman named Licinia Amias, and she has um, this, uh, her name is in Latin, and there's the D and M is an ancient Roman tradition, sort of like R-I-P, it means Dies Manibus, the sacred to the shades. But the word I'm looking at is this one up here, this ichthus zonton in Greek, and two fish coming to get hooked on an anchor, like a fish hook. And the anchor, of course, is the faith, and the two fish are being hooked on the faith, but the ichthus, of course, is the acrostic for Jesus Christ, Son of God, Savior, the first letters of those Greek words, and the fish of the living ones. So we see this connection here. These ideas, the fish and the acrostic, the fish being Jesus, being hooked on the fish, of the, hooked on the faith, <coughs> were combined in a line in a treatise on baptism written by Tertullian of Carthage at the beginning of the third century, emphasizing the idea that joining the school of, that baptism was joining a school of fish swimming after the big fish, Christ. He says, but we, being little fishes, as Jesus Christ is our big ichthus, are born in the water, and we are safe only so long as we remain in the water. Because the shepherd and the flock and the fish are figures that can be associated to many different scripture passages, their symbolism is more general than the images that are drawn directly from particular biblical narratives. Among the most popular images in early Christian art are a set of Old Testament figures, Noah, Moses, Jonah in particular, and then a set of New Testament images, Jesus changing the water to wine at Cana, Jesus with the Samaritan woman, and Jesus raising Lazarus. So let me take those now. Noah, one of the most frequently depicted Oh, there's, there's that line of Tertullian, I'm sorry. And fish from a baptismal font. Okay, here's Noah. One of the most frequently depicted biblical characters in early Christian art is Noah. Here he is in his ark, which might strike you as a little odd. This is just a small box with a lid. 
I don't want Jack in the box, little Noah in the box kind of stuff. <laughs> there are no animals, no Mrs. Noah, no children. He just floats along in this chest. Above, a dove, the symbol of Noah's deliverance, bears an olive branch in his beak. Here's one in which he's joined to Daniel. This is another story, but we have Noah in this little box on the right. The simplicity of this image is a clue to the viewer that there's more here than a literal illustration of the story from the book of Genesis. According to early Christian writings, including even the first and second epistles of Peter, 1 Peter 3 and 2 Peter 2, the purifying flood of Noah represents God's judgment against sinners. All right, I think I have this for you. With an image of Noah. The water also purifies in a positive sense. It washes away sin through baptism. The ark is the church. Its wood prefigures the cross. Both offer the baptized individual salvation. Ark as church and wood as cross. The dove, of course, dove Noah's dove, also connects to the Holy Spirit, descending on Jesus at his baptism, and of course descending upon all the baptized in the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thus, the deluge is both death-dealing and life-giving. In the fourth century, Ambrose of Milan said this to his candidates for baptism. Quote, In the flood, all the corruption of the flesh perished, and only the race and likeness of the righteous remained. Is this flood not baptism, by which all the sins are wiped out, and only the spirit and the grace of the righteous are revived? Okay. Next, Moses and the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians already lays out the symbolic possibilities of this story. In 1 Corinthians 10, he says, Our ancestors, yeah, it's sort of in white up there, but our ancestor, ancestors were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. So you can see how we use these stories to refer now to baptism. The Exodus scene appeared frequently in early Christian art, as here, in the Via Latina catacomb, and in a, on a number of 4th century sarcophagi. Here's one. Here's another one. Very soon, this story became a prototypical symbol for baptismal purification. The faithful Israelites were liberated through the water which covered and drowned the evil enemies. Interpreting Pharaoh and his army as vices or sins destroyed by baptismal water, the new people of God emerged safely on the other side, washed of their sins, and headed toward the Promised Land. Rather than a move from death to life, this image projects that transformation from slavery to freedom. Whereas the unbaptized formerly were enslaved to sin, their passage through the font transformed them into fully enfranchised citizens of heaven. So here's this text from Cyril of Jerusalem. I don't know if I have the whole thing here, but I'm going to read from my page. No, actually, I think I have a different one, so listen and, and then go back to looking at this. Here's what he says. This moment of your baptism was prefigured in antiquity when that tyrannous and cruel despot Pharaoh was opposing the noble, free-spirited Hebrew nation. God sent Moses to deliver them from their hard slavery. Pray, you passed from the old to the new, from the figure, the story, to the reality, baptism. Pharaoh pursued that people of old right into the sea. This outrageous spirit, this impudent author of all evil, followed each of you. Now, Pharaoh is now Satan or the devil. Followed each one of you up to the very safe verge of the saving stream. That other tyrant, Pharaoh, was engulfed and drowned in the Red Sea. This one, Satan, is destroyed in the saving fund. Okay. Next one. Jonah, swallowed and regurgitated. Depictions of Jonah being swallowed by the big fish 
being spat out and reclining on land were among the most popular in early Christian art. Often presented in distinct, sequential episodes, especially in catacomb painting, Jonah vastly outnumbers almost every other biblical character in pre-Constantinian funerary iconography. If we count all of the images of Jonah as separate, not as one in part, with part one, two, and three, he outdoes the good shepherd. So here's a kind of nice one. This is in the catacomb of Priscilla. Also, this is a uh, shepherd in the center of the dome of the ceiling. And we have praying figures around, but we also have the scenes from Jonah. Here he's being thrown overboard. Over here is actually would be a scene of Jonah um, with, the, with the tempest coming up and praying. He's being fed into the mouth. This is little Jonah's head right here, his arms. And here's the mouth of the sea monster opening up to receive him as the sailors are dumping him overboard. And here he is actually, this is a little out of order, because here he is being spit up again out of the mouth of the monster. Notice he's nude. This is really important about Jonah. Jonah's nude. And here he is in the last scene, always of the sequence of Jonah reclining under the gourd vine. Um, we don't get to see Nineveh, you know, um, repenting. We don't get to see God calling Jonah to Nineveh. All we see is the tempest, Jonah being cast into the mouth, Jonah being coming up again, and Jonah reclining. And Jonah's always new. That's kind of important, I think. A precedent for reading Jonah as a type of baptismal regeneration is, of course, offered by Christ himself. Because, Jonah refer because Jesus refers to the sign of Jonah as a figure of the three days in which the Son of Man was in the tomb, or would be in the tomb. Early Christians interpreted this as not only a sign, though, of Christ's death and resurrection, but as a symbol of their own death and resurrection by virtue of baptismal renewal and its promise of eventual bodily resurrection to heaven. Following Romans 6, they understood that through their baptism, they were buried by Christ, but also united with Christ in a resurrection like his. Among the early writers who made such a connection is Basil of Caesarea, who saw Jonah's three days in the fish's belly as symbolizing Christ's death and descent into Hades, but also as symbolizing the candidate's triple immersion in the font, the belly or womb of the church, followed by a regurgitation as the candidate steps out and onto dry land. The iconography shows Jonah naked as he goes into the creature's mouth and naked as he comes out. Here's another one. And there's this wonderful sarcophagus in Rome. It's, it's, um, I may have a detail of this coming up in time in which we see Jonah going into the mouth, Jonah coming up again, and Jonah here reclining. There's other images. Here's a good shepherd. Here's a fisher, just so you kind of get the It starts to be layering with this imagery. We're going to come back to this one. This is Lazarus, and here's another fisher image. This is Moses striking the rock in the wilderness, feeding the Israelites with their water, another baptismal image. Um, other episodes from his story, of course, as I said, are missing. So the call to Nineveh, the shriveling vine, is never part of the visual narrative. So this set of images concentrates on the passage, this time, the passage from death to life. And that's why Jonah's nudity is significant, since in this respect, he is like Adam before his fall, and like the candidates when they enter the font and are restored to their prelapsarian innocence for just a little while. They're naked in the font, in the baptismal room, like Adam and Eve, before they fell. That's not ashamed of their nudity. Okay. There's a detail of this. Of oh, these teeth on that oh, lovely monster. Notice how beautifully composed this is with the twining tails here. a different sarcophagus showing Jonah. And it's one of my favorites because this little, this little sailor is covering so I just can't look. I just can't watch. <laughs> it's covering his eyes. So, and then we have it quickly. All, here he goes in, here he comes out, and here he's lying down again. And there's the gourd vine. Okay, next image. Jesus changing water to wine. Depictions of the Canaan miracle are especially common on sarcophagus release. And a sarcophagus is a big stone coffin. That's what we, sarcophagus means flesh eater. <clears throat> That's what we call those big stone coffins that you might see in museums. 
They, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that they actually put the bodies in these boxes and covered them with lime, and so in fact the flesh did disintegrate in the box, uh, making room for another person to go in if needed. They're pretty expensive. I expect families shared them. Okay. So depictions of Cana miracle are, are most common, in fact, on sarcophagus reliefs. We'll work out why that is yet, but this composition generally shows Jesus pointing a staff at a series of large stone jars. Details referring to the wedding itself are rare. You rarely ever see the wedding couple, and almost only only one instance that I know of in early Christian art you see Jesus' mother. So normally you have Jesus with the stone jars and some of his followers. The iconography, I believe, emphasizes the transformation of water. Most early Christian writers interpreted the story, however, of Jesus arriving at a marriage feast and turning water into wine as having Eucharistic and not baptismal symbolism. And it is often juxtaposed with a scene of Jesus multiplying loaves. But I think the image could have had a baptismal significance as well, which is implied by its appearance in the late 4th century mosaic vault in Naples. And this is the Naples baptistry. That the story involves the transformation of water may be part of the explanation for its depiction in a baptistry. Tertullian of Carthage included the Canaan miracle in a list of his figures or types of baptism, possibly for this reason, and later Jerome argued that the water's ability to convey sacramental grace, that water's ability to convey sacramental grace was affirmed when Jesus made it the matter of his first miracle. But in any case, the Eucharistic significance of this imagery is not necessarily irrelevant to a baptismal meaning, since the reception of First Eucharist was the last stage of the ritual, and from that point on, the sacrament, in, in, a, in a very real sense, renewed the baptismal promise. So I think it can be both things, actually. Jesus meeting the Samaritan woman at the well. Visual representations of this story occur in the 3rd century baptistry at Dura Europus, as well as the Naples baptistry, where it is juxtaposed with the image of Jesus changing water to wine. Oh, I'm going to go back a little bit. You see it here again. So we have the woman at the well here with the, there she is, and this is the water in Cana. This is from the Via Latina catacomb. It's probably one of the oldest depictions of this scene in Christian art, uh, mid-fourth century. And here is this, uh, a detail from a sarcophagus that's in the Louvre Museum today. Uh, unfortunately, the, the well is sort of partially missing, but we do see the, the, the two of them. In contrast to the Cana miracle, Early Christian commentators consistently read this story as referring to living water, the story's reference to living water, as an unquestionable allusion to Christian baptism and the promise of eternal life that it offered. As such, the story of the Samaritan woman found its way into catechetical instruction just about everywhere. Gregory of Nazianzus cited it in his Oration on Baptism along with the text of Isaiah 55. Oh, all you th who thirst, come to the water. Okay. The, and here's what he says. This is Gregory's uh, quote from Oration 40. The blessing is on sale to you for your will alone. God accepts the yearning itself as a high price. Think of the text of Isaiah, you, without money, without price, uh, why should you pay the price? You know, okay. So God accepts the yearning itself as your high price. He thirsts, God thirsts to be thirsted for. God gives a drink to those wishing to drink. He is benefited by being asked for benefit. The great gift is at hand. He gives with more pleasure than others take in receiving. Blessed is the one of whom Christ asks a drink, like that Samaritan woman, and to whom he gives a fountain of life, a fountain of water springing up to eternal life. 
The baptismal significance of this narrative is inescapable, giving the narrative's allusion to Jesus' water as the water of eternal life. The images are easily discerned. The well is the font, the woman is the baptismal candidate, the one who needs forgiveness, and Jesus is the one who supplies the life-giving water, and he symbolizes the rites administrator. One bishop, Gaudentius of Brescia, even argued that Jesus actually baptized the woman in the story. Like the Cana scene, it alludes to the efficacy of the sacraments and emphasizes the abundance of grace available to those who come for them. Now we're going to look at this little image down here. But notice, just so you can, here we have Moses striking the rock again. Here is Noah. And this is a scene of the woman uh, with the issue of blood being healed. But we have these scenes that are beginning to make a pattern. I hope you begin to see my pattern. First waiting, I'm hoping. Okay. Jesus healing the paralytic, according to John. John's account of Jesus healing the sick man or the lame man by the pool of Bethesda is quite different from the story in the Synoptic Gospels concerning the healing of a paralytic. You know, the Synoptic Gospels, they lower him from the roof. But John's is the one where he's lying by the pool, waiting for someone, the angel will stir up the water, and hoping somebody will put him in the water. And he's kind of, he keeps getting bumped aside. <coughs> Excuse me. Although all four versions of this miracle associate Jesus' act of healing with his forgiveness of sins, only one, the Johannine version, takes place beside a body of water. Jesus and this sick or paralyzed man often appear in early Christian art, in the catacombs and on sarcophagi. Here's another one. Isn't he sweet? Oh, little he is, but he's carrying his bed here. But it also appears in the Dura Europa's baptistry. There he is. As is typical of most early Christian iconography, the depiction is abbreviated showing only the man sitting on or carrying away his bed. Here's one where, again, we have the woman with the issue of blood coming to Jesus, but we have the man with the bed walking away with it. This is a, a sarcophagus in the Vatican Museum. And we have a couple more details. This one from a sarcophagus in Arles, in which he's sitting on his bed and Jesus is healing him. And here's one where we have the wedding at Cana, joined to the image of the, the paralytic carrying away his bed. Um, the man is, interestingly, is depicted as child-sized, as you see, which is so often the case with in scenes of healing or renewal, where the one who receives healing is then um, made a very small-looking person, almost a child-sized person, which I cautiously interpret as a sort of a, ref a reflection on this as baptismal, because in baptism people return to the state of innocence of childhood. Even Jesus in his images of baptism, when Jesus is being baptized, is shown as a small child. A few compositions actually show the paralytic lying by the Bethesda pool. Here he is. And here he is carrying away his bed thus incorporating a visual reference to the healing water and strengthening its association with baptism, an association that is found in many Christian commentaries. Again, Ambrose of Milan prepared his catechumens for baptism by reminding them of this story. First, he explained that the angel, who normally stirred the water in the Bethesda pool, foreshadowed Jesus. In this instance, however, Jesus also appeared himself and chose this single individual to heal, he actually never puts it in the water, which is sort of interesting. Ambrose explains that while both the water in the pool and the baptismal font were miraculous, they could not be efficacious without the prayer and assist, presence and assistance of Christ. Someone who will help you into the pool, he says. Once in the pool, the petitioner is healed and forgiven of sins. There are many, many more scenes in early Christian art that I have interpreted to express one or more or another benefit or aspect of baptism. Moses striking the rock in the wilderness is one very obvious one, and we've seen it a few times here. Daniel emerging from his lion's den 
Why is that baptismal? Because he's, re he's reborn. He's, remember the story, um, the tomb is there and you have to roll away the stone in the morning and the king, Darius, comes and finds that Daniel was alive inside his tomb. Jesus healing the man born blind. Um, very important story for baptism because if you remember in that story, the man is both told to, that his, his sins are forgiven, and the, sins, the question of forgiveness of sins becomes very important, but Jesus also anoints his eyes with clay and tells him to wash them off, washes the, his eyes off in the pool of Siloam. Um, the five wise virgins carrying their lamps to the tent of the bridegroom. We've seen that in Dura Europas. And finally, Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Now that's one of the most common scenes on early Christian tombs, and it makes sense, obviously, for Lazarus to be in a Christian tomb. Wouldn't we all want to be resurrected from the dead like Lazarus? Well, maybe we wouldn't be, but anyway, that's the story. But in some sense, the whole sense of emerging from the tomb, the idea of resurrection, again, becomes very important. I should also add that in, in these stories, um, Lazarus is often shown as a small nude at Jesus' feet after the resurrection. Daniel's always nude, so the, the nudity kind of fits into the whole patterning. Now, not all Christian art is related to or reflects on baptism. I'm not trying to say everything does, although sometimes they get really close. But what I hope that I'm communicating in this short time is not even that, but it's the potential of visual art to contain and convey manifold meanings simultaneously and through many different images and sometimes juxtaposed and in composition with one another. So here, this is a sarcophagus in Rome, dates to about 280, and we see this wonderful bathtub-shaped coffin. On this side are the sailors that are going to throw Jonah overboard. Here's Jonah reclining under his gourd vine, um, with a sheep of the shepherd over here, above. And this is a couple of figures, a praying figure and a reading figure. They're a little enigmatic, but they may refer to um, the, the, the couple buried here. And over here is an image, actually, of John the Baptist baptizing this little new figure that's Jesus, little childlike figure. So nudity is important, I think, in these images. Jonah is a symbol of, of, re of reclining in paradise after baptism. But he has come out, he's been regurgitated um, and, and put out in dry land. It, around the side, and you have to trust me on this, are fishers <laughs> catching fish in nets. And this again is the Jonah sarcophagus, and so we see the image of Lazarus, we see the fisher, we see Jonah, we see actually Noah here, and we see the fisher again, and the good shepherd, and Moses striking the rock. This is probably a little bit of an enigmatic scene, but this is probably the women worshiping at Jesus' feet after the resurrection. So what I'm trying to say is that this art is never simply illustrative. It's already become symbolic, and it's doing textual exegesis, and it fits in with the way people are brought into the faith and think of what's going to be significant to them on what, what is the most significant piece of art they can have, the art that decorates their tombs. In my earlier lecture, I told you about how our Roman Catholic practice of baptizing adult, about our Roman Catholic practice of baptizing adult converts at the Easter Vigil, something we call the uh, rite of Christian initiation in adulthood. Yesterday, last this, yesterday Sunday, those who are preparing for either baptism or confirmation at our church underwent one of the three scrutinies of candidates as part of the process. These scrutinies are renewed or updated forms of a very ancient ritual, all the way back to the fourth century, maybe earlier, in which the church asked candidates to search their consciences and affirmed their sincere desire to join the community. The new form, developed shortly after Vatican II, takes place on the third, fourth, and fifth Sundays at Lent within the church, and when we ask the, the candidates to kneel, and they receive both exorcism and blessings. But these third, fourth, and fifth Sunday texts, when you have candidates for baptism, must be the texts of the woman at the well, the healing of the man born blind, 
and the raising of Lazarus. They, so they draw upon the same sacred stories that were at the very core of early Christian baptismal preparation. It's very deliberate. The church actually went back and decided this is what the, how they were going to do it, and they were going to do it just like they thought the early church did it. The same stories that are so frequently represented in early Christian art, including Jesus changing water to wine at Cana, Jesus conversing with the Samaritan woman at the well, Jesus healing the man born blind, Jesus healing the paralytic at the pool, and Jesus raising Lazarus. I think we could add Nicodemus maybe to that list. I believe this is key to our understanding of early Christian art. It is one of the ways that early Christians visualized the moment of their entry into the community and reminded them of their baptismal identity as they faced death and anticipated their future resurrection. all that as well. But my question is this. All these texts, which, I want to say this, this may not be true, but I'm going to say it anyway, which we no longer look at as primarily baptismal texts, but which were interpreted or made to fit the baptismal ritual. How is, how is this similar or different from the way the church dealt with what are now called Eucharistic texts. Um, like uh, the multiplying of loaves, you mean? Or? Yes. <coughs> I don't. I think it's similar. Um, what I what I really see here is that the art is integrated with the practices of people in their lives of faith. They're hearing these stories in church context. They're not hearing them outside, necessarily, out of liturgical context. They may be doing Bible study, too. But these stories are interpreted to have meaning for the things that they are doing. And so I think that we could say they're very, this, like the multiplication of loaves, um, the wedding at Cana, um, sometimes we see it, we often see an image of a meal, which I actually think is an image of a funerary meal, pointing to a post-resurrectional banquet. Um, but this incorporates, and on that, what's really interesting is often on that table, and it shows up in images, early images of the Last Supper, almost always the thing that they're eating is a fish. So I always ask, ask my students, if I do this on Eucharist, you know, why is there a fish at the Last Supper? Well, because we're eating the great fish, right? And that's what this is about. And, and, the, and in Jewish tradition, the messianic, messianic meal was going to be a large fish as well. So this is layered. I think all of these things are, are significant in terms of how we understand that art. But also tells us how much that played into to their experience of what they were doing in the church. Oh, kind of making sense. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was different. I would say it was kind of the same. I was thinking of Perpetuus, uh, the account of her martyrdom. And at the very end of that account, the, uh, the crowd cries out, well washed, well washed. Um, martyrdom was considered second baptism. So I'm wondering, in the artistic depictions of early martyrs, is there baptismal imagery within that artistic representation or allusion to baptism when that's being depicted artistically? 
You know what's so hard about that question is we have very few early Christian images of martyrs. This is really later. Um, so I do think that the baptism of blood, uh, which is what martyrdom is, and so if one is martyred, you don't have to, you know, you, you're in. <laughs> Whether you survive or you die. <laughs> um, uh, I forget where I fit this in, but it is actually, um, you're right, and, and I think one could, one, one thing that's a wonderful image of the good shepherd, and I, I don't know if this is connected, there's a wonderful image of the shepherd in one of the catacombs, and the sheep are being drenched. And I wonder if that isn't a sort of allusion to martyrdom. Sacrificial lambs being drenched um, could be, a, rather than a literal interpret, real, literal presentation of martyrdom, is a, a symbolic presentation of martyrdom. Yeah. Yeah. I may have misheard, but I wanted you to uh, elaborate on the uh, turning the water to wine when you mentioned the jars. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought you said they were really large and then you <laughs> These were little, yeah. They were little tiny. They <coughs> made the association with the burial and the wine and that. Did you? Ah, that maybe got a little confused. Yeah, I think that maybe layered. Yeah. yeah, sometimes the jars are not. Sometimes they're very big and sometimes they're not so big. I uh, probably should have said sometimes you actually see the little ones like you have here. And it's very often juxtaposed with, in fact, the multiplication of loaves. So you have water, wine, and bread. Um, and fishes. So we get fish, wine, water. Um, so that may just be something I need to just nuance a little bit. The sarcophagus, that's a different subject. When I'm trying to explain the meaning of that word, I'm using the word sarcophagus, and it doesn't always, not everybody knows what that is. It's a big, what people who had a certain amount of wealth, this didn't take, we, this is good evidence that Christians had a fair amount of money before Constantine, some of them did anyway, that you could afford a tomb, a coffin like this, sometimes elaborately carved. Now those are rare, but you have an awful lot of those in museums today, in the Vatican Museum, in the British Museum, in Louvre, and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And they're called sarcophagi, and this is a word actually used at this time, we didn't always think so, which means flesh eater. So what, I, what I'm proposing is that it in fact was a way for flesh to decay within the coffin. Christians, Christians practice inhumation, burial of bodies, rather than cremation. Um, and Romans began to do it around the 2nd or 3rd century as well. It's a long discussion, but Christians did it because they believed in the resurrection of the body. But if you, if you can let the body, the flesh disintegrate, you can gather the bones and put it in a jar and reuse your tomb. If you're going to pay that kind of money for a tomb, I expect in many cases that's what happened, that uh, spouses would be buried together, one after the other and maybe even reuse of these tombs. They, they came to be used, interestingly enough, um, quite often after they were discovered in the 15th and 16th centuries, they came to be used right off, quite often as altar frontals. Because they were beautiful pieces of sculpture. But it's kind of interesting to think about that um, as we think about the reuses. And did you make that association with the, turning the water to wine? I don't think so. Oh, okay. Maybe that was just a... I'm I might have... Okay, I'm glad I have. Yeah. No, no connection there. One of the things that you said when you were talking about how the ark was used, it had both a literal sense, and, mm -hmm. and I don't remember exactly the word in the second side, so I'm going to use the word symbolic yeah. in the sense. Okay. Um, and and that, that it was a way of doing textual exegesis. Mm -hmm. And that got my mind to spinning a little bit, um, kind of dovetailing with Dwight's first part of White's comment, is it that in that day and time too, I believe that the allegorical method of biblical interpretation was pretty much the rule, which had the two senses, mm -hmm. the literal sense and the mm -hmm. sense of the kind of the underlying meaning or the right. whatever else, which, which seems to me that the use of art, the use of textual criticism or, or hermeneutic would have been parallel. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I guess part of my question is, is that a fair assessment? The other side of that is then kind of bringing it forward into a, into a period where we don't really acknowledge the allegorical interpretation as much. How do we deal with the question of art and all of this 
as a way of representing or uh, helping us to tell the story or interpret the story. Let me say, first of all, that you exactly what I'm trying to say. Um, Christians had different levels of interpretation. One of them was the literal interpretation, this historical interpretation. One was a moral interpretation. You know, what does it mean? You know, what's, what does it mean for my life? You know, how should I be obedient to God's commands? Abraham and Isaac is a symbol of faith and obedience. And then the next level is sort of the typological or figurative level, in which Isaac is not just a story that happened or even a moral exhortation, but Isaac becomes Christ. And this is really common in the early church. And that the next level is a sort of allegory, and, for, and the one beyond that is sort of the allegorical interpretation where, you know, the tree means this and the ram's horn means that, and pretty soon you're kind of often, almost really often a symbolism. And it's true, we don't, most of us don't work with that kind of interpretation anymore. And one of the reasons we don't is not just because it's sort of gone out of style, but because we're so anxious about interpreting Old Testament stories with Christological significance. We recoil from that. I mean, that's, boy, that sounds like Christian supersessionism to people. And the church didn't have any problem with that. They, they weren't saying these things weren't true, or that in, they, they, they simply saw in them pointers to meaning beyond their literal sense. And so I think for us, for, for thinking about this and applying to art today, if we, if we ask artists only to illustrate stories and not teach us something about the levels of meaning in those stories, we're really hampering what we know about visual art and what it can do. So what's sort of interesting is that we don't actually have an image of Jesus crucified until really the beginning of the fifth century because nobody really needed to have that. They had the story of Isaac to tell, to tell us about that. So, I think it's a way of letting us do the kind of work that, that textual critics can do with stories and, and find in them many, many levels and possibilities of meaning. And letting the artist do that too. Um, because I think we have grown up with a kind of a literalist mindset about what Christian art should be. And, and it can never be that anyway. I mean, an artist has to already make decisions about what color is Mary's dress, where were they sitting, what part of the story am I going to show? So already the artist is already doing interpretation. Just this is just a way of even, uh, acknowledging how much more is there. I was grateful that uh, you spoke of earlier Ithacus, which sums things up. In other words, it shows us what the basics are, and we should be excited about the basics. The more complicated we make things, the more we cross ourselves up and polarize ourselves, it seems to me. <laughs> All right, amen to that. <laughs> shown you more of these Jesus, often, well, every time until those Ravenna images where Jesus is a full grown man, Jesus is always shown in his baptism as a small figure, childlike figure. It's really startling, and, and it, many years ago when I first looked at this, I was trying to figure out why. You know, we don't think Jesus was baptized as an infant. It's not an argument for infant baptism. I just know I wouldn't buy that. So what is it that, why show this? Now, one of the things that happens in sermons to the newly baptized, as the newly baptized are addressed as children, pueri, infantes, you know, infants, children, um, no matter how old or how big they are, you know, 
And they're all children for a little while. So in baptism, one is returned to the innocence and state of child, for a week or so at least. <laughs> and I think that's what's being implied here. Not passivity, not helplessness, but that, and that's really going a little one step out on my limb, that I've gone, to say that these images are showing the paralytic as a baptized, a newly baptized person, as well as a symbol for baptism. So we make him small, we make the little Lazarus when coming out of the tomb often as a little naked boy. Um, you know, we know he was an old man, brother of Mary and Martha, you know, so um, an old man maybe, but not a little boy. And um, so I think that's the, you know, I don't, nobody left an, an, an explanation for me. So that's mine. Um, and, and I think it works, and it works with the, the use of nudity. For example, Daniel is always nude in early Christian art in the West. And I, you know, the, the first year I was teaching, some students said, why is Daniel nude? I don't get that. And I'm going, well, gee, that's interesting. You know, there's nothing in the text that says he was nude. And he's, he's very obviously nude. I mean, it's just like, stands, sticks out like a sore thumb. And I, some people, oh, it's a heroic figure. You know, heroes in Greek art were always nude. Okay, maybe, but, but, no, but Noah's not nude, and Moses isn't nude, and Abraham's not nude, so that doesn't work. So I find that it had to be some kind of liturgical reference, perhaps, to baptism, just a thought. Creation of Adam. Creation of Adam. Well, and Adam and Eve are nude. I mean, that. And they're small. And they're small, yeah. When that creation, in the images of creation of Adam and Eve, they're also little. So. That's right. I mean, and that's kind of the same idea, right? We are returned to that, uh, the innocence of childhood. Um, Any other questions? Yeah. 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 Thank you, because that's the second point I should have made. I think in this one, Jesus, um, we participate. Jesus participates in us, and we in Him in His baptism. And I think that's what's being said here. Not that Jesus was returned to the state of innocence. I think that's a little hard to go theologically too. But I think when when the question comes up in the early church, which which is really interesting, because uh, it comes up all the time with children in Sunday school. Why did Jesus have to be baptized? I mean, was you know, what did He repent of? Um, and the answer always from the early church was, he did it in order to um, consecrate the act for everyone else, as the model for us. So by making him small, in a sense, we're participating in it. I think there's the similarity, the kind of solidarity with Christ-likeness. Um, that's the answer I give, but... The other question is, a little harder to... These images, biblical images, were basically chosen in a persecution context. Uh, the first, maybe, maybe the second and third centuries, especially, mm -hmm. where um, I, it's pretty easy for me to see why they were chosen most of those that they selected for that. Come over to our present context. Uh, Baptists basically have been anti-iconic <laughs> or anti-Puritan uh, forebears, those that have church windows and things like that. And um, yet I'm wondering if there are ways that uh, you, from your own Catholic tradition, would develop. Some things we could do in our contemporary context that would enhance the meaning of that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think baptism has become pretty perfunctory when Baptists, you know, I've heard people up in Duncan, they might not come back next week. Could we do something to help people understand more fully? Uh, why we continue this practice? 
You know, I, one of the things that happens a lot when I'm talking about baptism to people who aren't Baptists or disciples who practice adult immersion, or you know, there's a certain jealousy sometimes <laughs> about wanting, to, wishing I could go through it now that I know what it means and I was baptized and sprinkled as a baby. And, um, so I think the perfunctoriness is not certainly not limited to Baptists. Um, and I think that all of us probably want to think about how to make this ritual richer, uh, more profound and meaningful for those who undergo it. Um, and when you hear about how early Christians baptized, there's a certain kind of shock, you know, to the sensuality of this, the bodiliness, um, the way that it was accompanied with catechetical uh, teaching and Bible stories being interpreted. Um, People being um, encouraged to be, uh, so for example, I said like the anointing was often compared to the anointing of a wrestler getting ready to go into the ring because yeah. in that fudge, you know, you're going to fight with Satan and Satan's going to want to grab you, but you're slippery and so you're harder to pin. Um, or, uh, you know, in the mark, the sign of Christ, you know, you're being marked like the sheep, you know, branded or like the soldier being tattooed so that you belong to the flock and you belong to the to the troops, and you belong to the, the army of Christ. And um, these, these, these um, sermons are so full of wonderful imagery that, um, and that can just go on and on and on, but you know that the, uh, the, the gift of the Holy Spirit and the scented oil, you know, the scent of the Holy Spirit, it stays in your nostrils for a whole week. You know, um, so, yeah, I think that we all, all of us, and I, I, I will credit the Catholic Church a little bit for, for suddenly realizing it was, it was having people come to it who weren't baptized as adults. And they're thinking, well, we can't just sprinkle them. You know, we need to, well, let's do more with this. And so there is a real effort to recover these scrutinies and these stories and put people through a long catechetical process. And then at the Easter vigil, to baptize them, which is pretty dramatic. Um, you know, all the lights are out and these candles and there's a you know, three hour service and people are beginning to swoon from the heat and you know, incense is burning and then we're gonna baptize and dunk these adults. And it's not just for the people who are being baptized, it's for everybody in the congregation. They're all moved by this. So I, I'm just agreeing with you. I'm just thinking of ways we might um, recover some. We agree with you, and thank you for joining me again. <laughs>